Welcome, everyone, to this briefing brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. In Hebrew, name is Abit Chonistim. IDSF is the leading Israeli organization advocating for strong national security to defend Israel. Thank you to all of our viewers and supporters for tuning into this briefing. A very special thank you to Brigadier General Amir Avivi, the founder and chairman of IDSF, who is joining us for this briefing. Uh, we are planning today to do a question and answer session. We've received many, many questions. We always receive questions. It's great to receive them. We're going to try to get through some questions which uh, we have not been able to talk about uh, recently. If you'd like to submit a question during this briefing, please, of course, feel free to send it into the chat or to send it in my email, Moshe, M-O-S-H-E, at idsf.org.il. General, thank you so much for joining again today. So the first question I wanted to jump into is this news that came out about Israel releasing the Shifa Hospital director, and I wanted to get your take on the decision to send that person back to Gaza, um, and, and who is responsible in the Israeli defense establishment for those types of decisions? So, very bad decision. Very unclear how something like that happened, especially because this guy is deeply, deeply involved in terror. He hosted really huge amounts of terrorists inside the hospital. He also, you uh, know, enabled them to bring the hostages in the hospital, and inside the hospital, they killed hostages. So, Talking about a guy that on one hand is so involved in terror, on the other hand, is a symbol. It's unbelievable that they released him. And uh, in order to release someone like that, in order to release somebody like that, you need to, the Shabbat needs to approve this in writing and uh, send this approval to the army. The army needs to sign this. And then it's moved to uh, the prison, uh, and the prison releases it. But also them, they are supposed to notify the minister, the high-ranking commander, that a uh, guy that is uh, at the level of this guy is, is going to be released and this is something that uh, didn't happen it seems like the whole coordination uh, and notifying also the prime minister minister so not, not, nothing of this sort happened and this is something that really really requires a serious investigation how something like, like that could, could occur And do you think that, in general, releasing prisoners weakens Israel's position in terms of the ability to negotiate for hostages, meaning there's broader implications for a decision like this? Well, obviously, you know, uh, releasing prisoners, if it's not some kind of deal, it doesn't make sense. Now, there was a claim that there is not enough place in the prisons, but in times of war, you can build, uh, you know, uh, prisons with tents, and uh, it's, it's not something that's so complicated. I mean, it was done in the past. There are solutions that are intermediary. You don't need a whole jail for that. So, I don't know. It seems to me like they're not really organizing the way they're supposed to do it when you are really dealing with a, with a big war and not uh, some kind of uh, small operation. So in terms of this decision, does it raise concern about other types of decisions that are being made in this war that are not to your liking or that are not in Israel's strategic interest? I Meaning, is there a concern that things are just not being run professionally on many different levels? So I think that when you have decision-making that uh, involves the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Internal Security, and the prison, the prisons, and, and it has also international uh, applications and so on. 
the Prime Minister's office is supposed to coordinate that. I would expect to see the Prime Minister's office because it's several different ministries coordinating this effort and for some reason it didn't happen. So to connect this to another thing that you have spoken extensively about, uh, the, the failure of the military intelligence community to bring their concerns before October 7th to the prime minister's office, to the Ministry of Defense. So is this another repeat of that failure of the inability of these two sides to speak to each other? I, I, I was, uh, you know, very surprised to learn that with such really unusual intelligence that was on the 7th of October in the night, they didn't wake up the, the prime minister and the minister of defense or at least spoke, spoke to the officers, to the secretaries, to the military secretaries. It's very, very unusual. A huge mistake of the army and the sin bets. Uh, and, uh, you know, so the war will be over. We'll have to really go into it uh, deeply and understand how things like that happen. We are supposed to notify them when something so big is about to happen, even if they didn't understand the extent of what is going to happen, even if it was just maybe they are going to attack one city or something, or one town. Okay, let's move on from this question. And again, thank you to all of our viewers who are sending in questions. General, there was an article yesterday in the New York Times where six current or former security officials unnamed uh, spoke about the need to uh, come to a truce in Gaza. There was a mention that Israel's low on munitions. What are your thoughts on that article and those six unnamed uh, military officials? First, I have a serious uh, problem with this uh, phenomena of unnamed people. I've never even once said something that is not on the record. If somebody has an opinion and he believes in what he says, and that's to speak their mind and say what they think. So I don't know what it means, all these unnamed people. The army said clearly it's not their policy, they don't agree with this, it's not them. So I don't know who these officials are. I do know that this is exactly why IDSF was created to bring a resolute, strong voice that pushes Israel to victory and not surrender. Thank you, General, for sharing that. And, uh, you know, you're a very busy person. You're traveling from one place to the other. So we really appreciate your time. And thank you to all of our viewers for uh, tolerating the uh, audio qualities right now. We are absolutely doing our very best. Okay, so General, let's just try to hone in a little bit about um, th these six security officers, whether they uh, approached the New York Times or it was the other way around. Um, I mean, is it sound military reasoning that if there is a truce in Gaza, so then that that is the way to get back the hostages? Has the war thus far had any indication of that that is a successful way of doing it? No, of course not. I mean, uh, we cannot surrender. We cannot give up destroying Hamas. We need to to win this war. And the winning this war is also bringing back all the hostages, but they're not going to come back uh, by us surrendering to Hamas. They're not going to release all the hostages. And also we cannot, uh, you know, uh, create a reality where Hamas can rebuild itself and then attack us again and take more hostages. We need to end this cycle. We need to destroy Hamas. This is what uh, we need to do. Since the beginning of this war, General, you have met with the Prime Minister and many people in the defense establishment many a times. Are these other voices, these six anonymous security officials, are they also having those meetings and pushing from the other direction? I don't think they're having these meetings with the Prime Minister. He wouldn't listen to voices like that, not at this stage. 
Uh, maybe some of these voices are heard by the Minister of Defense, um, but he also listens to us. Um, so I don't think that these voices are really affecting, uh, at least not the Prime Minister's level, the way he sees the war, and he keeps saying again and again that Israel will destroy Hamas and reach all goals of war, including bringing back all the hostages. Okay, final question on this, and then we'll move on. So, so this New York Times article, who who does it have an impact on? Is it U.S. policymakers that are going to be forward to this article? Is it Israeli society who are going to wake up and be told that, wow, look, there are defense uh, professionals um, who believe this? Meaning, if it's not going to affect the prime minister, uh, what implications could this have? Well, I think that uh, what we are seeing is an attempt of the newspaper to push some agenda that is uh, completely not aligned with uh, Israel's government uh, goals or even the army goals. And they're trying to create some kind of uh, atmosphere or public opinion, but uh, not going to work. And it's not, I don't think it's really affecting in Israel anything. Now, Israel has been at war for many, many months and is potentially bracing for escalations up north. What is the level of supplies and munitions right now in Israel? Does Israel have enough weapons and munitions to win these wars? Well, I think that when you conduct a big war, you always see that you don't have enough munitions. Something that... Uh, Basically, uh, every single bit more, you still you don't have enough forces, you don't have enough things. And uh, I think that uh, we need to understand that this is not a small operation as before, this is a little bit more. And this is what you find, this is what you have. And the way that I better find spirit and resolution, that's uh, how many munitions you have. And uh, we need to be, I think that overall, uh, since the beginning of the war, the Israeli society you know, was pretty quiet. We have seen in the last eight months much less attack than before, the, before, the two years before. And we need to keep it like that. We need to make sure that there is no awakening of uh, radical Israeli Arabs that will be emboldened to attack Israelis. Um, so I'm not sure that this attack represents really something that we can say about uh, what's going on in the society, the Arab society. And I hope that this is uh, something very local and not a phenomena that we see growing. And to that extent, what is the status right now in Judea and Samaria in terms of the level of escalations or the presence of the IDF? Is there an uptick in problems in that region? Well, we have arrested more than 4,000 terrorists, killed more than 700. And the IDF is operating constantly, every day, everywhere in Judea and Samaria. Uh, so it's managing to contain terror from this area and really uh, make sure that it doesn't spill into uh, the center of Israel. Uh, so overall, I think the IDF is doing a good job. Many of our viewers want to know if you have any inside scoop about Sinwar's location or the relevance of being able to identify where he is. Well, um, I think definitely there is a big uh, intelligence effort to locate him. I think that at the end of the day, there will be a moment where the Palestinians themselves will hand him to Israel. Uh, for this, we need to really get the understanding in the Palestinian society that we are controlling the area that Hamas is not controlling anymore, that they cannot, Hamas cannot control their lives. Once we reach this point, then uh, probably we'll see uh, us finding him.
There recently, there's more in the news about Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Are you able to comment on, you know, not just focusing on Hamas, but all of these other groups? Uh, you know, the extent to which Israel needs to destroy them all and not just focus on Hamas. Palestinian Islamic Jihad is an Iranian militia, a female Iranian militia, and the uh, Iranians are funding them, equipping them. They have Iranian ideology, and uh, they are forced inside Gaza and inside Judea and Samaria. We need to deal with. So it's not just about Hamas, also about them, and I will need to also destroy them. Okay, switching topics completely, the issue of the ultra-Orthodox draft. What are your opinions on that huge topic, and specifically it coming to you know the table now in the middle of a war? So I, I think that when Israel faces really a challenge that we're facing now, probably an existential challenge, everybody needs to join the army, everybody. I think that our existence is uh, more important than anything else. And, and I would, see, would like to see all, all of them joining the army. And I mean all of them, even uh, guys that uh, really are studying Torah. And I say why, why I say that. Because what happens today is that they're saying, uh, okay, the guys who don't study Torah, they go to the army and the others won't. So basically, they're saying these guys that are not studying Torah, they are like class B. And these are the kind of guys who sent to the army. And this means that they are not going to get a good match. The sisters are not going to get a good match. And like we are creating a class B. Going to the army is not class B. The best of the best need to go to the army. So I think that even if we want a group to study day and night Torah, do it in uniform. Go in the army and study Torah. You can do a brigade of uh, Torah studies. Uh, but we need everybody to, to join the army. And to people who say that uh, studying Torah defends Israel, I say yes, probably too. I mean, it has depended that for 2,000 years. But we are from the age of 21 to 121, 100 years to study Torah and defend Israel. At the age of 18, you go to the army. And all of us, each, each one of us has a, a career path, each one of us has a passion or something he wants to do in his life. But we all go to the army between the age 18 and 21. And then we really build our future and, and, and contribute in any way we can. And I, I think that the, the one thing that we need to do when we draft school for Orthodox is make sure that they have a, an atmosphere, a unit, that they can fit their way of living, not bring them in order to make them uh, uh, different from what they are. So the army needs to adapt. The army needs to build brigades or division of the uh, Haredim that really will give them everything they need to keep their way of living, but they need to fight and they need to serve like everybody else. I mean, I see my daughter or daughters and sons and the others that uh, already did 150, 200 days of, uh, of uh, reserve and risking their life or even dying. You cannot have part of uh, the, the society with all the burden and praying, paying also the price. And another part that says we're not part of this. We're busy just studying in uh, yeshiva. It, it doesn't work like that. And uh, I think that we in IDSF, the way we approach it, looking at national security, it's not by saying that we, we, we don't believe that Torah is important. We think it's very important. It's not by saying that we think that Torah is not Protecting Israel, we think it does. But they are used when people need to serve the country. And everybody needs to say that. And we're not saying this thing from a stance of not liking uh, ultra orthodox or something like that, on the contrary. And I can say that uh, many, many ultra orthodox follow us. 
and, and really like IDSF. Uh, but we are looking at it from a national security point of view, and from this point of view, everybody needs to join down. And thank you. And looking at the ultra orthodox units that currently exist, or even a little more broadly, the the religious Zionists, the Dati Umi, the Hezder units that exist, does the army look at all of those as favorable and have been a, a you know a, a contribution to the army, or it's a liability with the amount of adjustments and modifications needed? I think that until the seventh of October, the army looked at it as a liability. They didn't have any interest to recruit ultra orthodox. And they even, you know, shortened the period of service and, and didn't think they need so many soldiers. But now everything reversed and they are talking about they need for 10,000 soldiers more. And now everybody understands we need also the ultra orthodox. So things are changing. And with these changes, the army needs to adapt as well. Thank you to everyone who uh, has been sending in questions, who continues to send in questions. They are much appreciated. We try to reach as many as possible. General, I think uh, one final question is really um, the, the pace of things moving in Gaza, uh, where the defense minister recently said that it's very much winding down. And uh, I think it was a few weeks ago on the briefing, you spoke about a disconnect between the field officers in Gaza, what they're reporting, and the higher brass, what they're reporting. And I'm curious if there's been any uh, conclusions drawn about uh, who was right and how much longer we'll be uh, in Gaza. In Gaza will be for years, but the question is, when uh, is the army going to reach the point where it controls well, well the area and can move most of the units north. And the, the army estimates it will be in the coming week. And if this happens, the government needs to decide when and what to do uh, in Lebanon. And our position is clear. In Lebanon, we need to attack. We need to push Hezbollah out of South Lebanon. We need to hit Hezbollah hard. And we need to set the terms needed to bring back a citizen safely home. Okay, you know, we got we got two more important questions that just came in, uh, both of them connected to this issue of the ultra-Orthodox in the army. One question is that there was a report that came out, and I, I haven't seen it, uh, that uh, thousands of ultra-Orthodox enlisted, but the IDF only accepted a small percentage of them. The viewers want you to comment on that, whether that report is true and what that means. And then the flip side, uh, that uh, while it's true that many ultra-Orthodox don't uh, attend, don't, don't draft, there are many um, other people in Israeli society who figure out how to dodge the draft. And that is likewise an issue that people are raising. So this report is not true. And um, there were many ultra-Orthodox that came and say we are willing to join the reserve, meaning do a week or two uh, of like very basic training and then join in reserve. We are talking about people who are old, like, I mean, old, 40, 50, 30, not a young group. And all of this are not fighting units. We are talking about uh, units that are not uh, fighting units. And the army needs combat soldiers, um, we didn't see a rise in young Haredim, 18, 19, coming and saying, we want to join Golani or the paratroopers or even the uh, Haredi battalion. So this is not happening. And, and, and I think that we must, must see a change also in the approach of the rabbis and leaders and understand that in this crucial moment, they need to really uh, understand that they need to join the army and fight alongside their fellow Israelis. And then that final question, is there any truth to other segments within Israeli society who refuse to serve and that's a, that's a big issue for the state? 
So I think there are definitely people who try to avoid military service or uh, not go to combat units. Um, but when you look at the overall picture of Jews who are not doing military service or meaningful military service, more than 50% of this number are ultra-Orthodox. So yes, there is also others, but the ultra-Orthodox issue is dramatic. And it's getting bigger and bigger because the, the, the ultra-Orthodox society is growing uh, fast, faster than, than other groups. So yes, we have worked to do in Tel Aviv and in other places and get people more Zionist and uh, more... Uh, uh, motivated to do meaningful service. This is what IDSF does. This is the whole the whole thing we do in uh, high schools and pre-army programs and all the education we do. But the the ultra orthodox issue is, is a huge, huge, big issue, and needs to be addressed. Brigadier General Amir Avivi, thank you so much for sharing all of that, for joining us in this briefing today. Thank you to all our viewers and our supporters for tuning in. Tomorrow in the U.S. is the 4th of July. We'll be on break. We wish everyone celebrating a happy 4th of July. We will be back with you next week, Monday, 10 a.m. Eastern time, 5 p.m. here in Israel. Until then, stay safe, stay strong. Take care, everyone.